Chapter 6 Captain Cully fell asleep thirteen stanzas into the nineteenth song, and Schmendrick, who had stopped laughing somewhat sooner, promptly set about trying to free himself. He strained against his bonds with all his strength, but they held fast. Jack Jingley had wrapped him in enough rope to rig a small schooner, and tied knots the size of skulls. Gently, gently, he counselled himself. No man with the power to summon Robin Hood, indeed to create him, can be bound for long. A word, a wish, and this tree must be an acorn on a branch again. This rope be green in a marsh. But he knew before he called on it that whatever had visited him for a moment was gone again, leaving only an ache where it had been. He felt like an abandoned chrysalis. Do as you will, he said softly. Captain Cully roused at his voice and sang the fourteenth stanza. There are fifty swords without the house, and fifty more within, and I do fear me, Captain, they are like to do us in. Ha done, ha done, says Captain Cully, and never fear again, for they may be a hundred swords, but we are seven men. I hope you get slaughtered, the magician told him, but Cully was asleep again. Schmendrick attempted a few simple spells for escaping, but he could not use his hands, and he had no more heart for tricks. Whatever happened instead was that the tree fell in love with him and began to murmur fondly of the joy to be found in the eternal embrace of a red oak. Always, always, it sighed, faithfulness beyond any man's deserving. I will keep the colour of your eyes when no other in the world remembers your name. There is no immortality but a tree's love. I'm engaged, Schmendrick excused himself, uh, to a western lodge uh, since childhood, marriage by contract. No choice in the matter. Hopeless. Our story is never to be. A gust of fury shook the oak, as though a storm were coming to it alone. Calls and fire blight on her, it whispered savagely. Damn softwood, cursed conifer, deceitful evergreen, she'll never have you. We will perish together, and all trees shall treasure our tragedy. Along his length, Schmendrick could feel the tree heaving like a heart, and he feared that it might actually split in two with rage. The ropes were growing steadily tighter around him, and the night was beginning to turn red and yellow. He tried to explain to the oak that love was generous precisely because it could never be immortal. And then he tried to yell for Captain Colley, but he could only make a small creaking sound like a tree. She means well, he thought, and gave himself up for loved. Then the ropes went slack as he lunged against them, and he fell to the ground on his back, wriggling for air. The unicorn stood over him, dark as blood in his darkened vision. She touched him with her horn. When he could rise, she turned away, and the magician followed her, weary of the oak, though it was once again as still as any tree that had never loved. The sky was still black, but it was a watery darkness through which Schmendrick could see the violet dawn swimming. Hard silver clouds were melting as the sky grew warm. Shadows dulled, sounds lost their shape, and shapes had not yet decided what they were going to be that day. Even the wind wandered about itself. "'Did you see me?' he asked the unicorn. "'Were you watching? Did you see what I made?' Yes, she answered, it was true magic. The loss came back, cold and bitter as a sword. It's gone now, he said. I had it. It had me, but it's gone now. I couldn't hold it. 
the unicorn floated on before him, silent as a feather. Close by, a familiar voice said, Leaving us so early, magician, the men will be sorry they missed you. He turned and saw Molly Grew leaning against a tree. Dress and dirty hair tattered alike, bare feet bleeding and beslimed, she gave him a bat's grin. Surprise, she said. It's made Marian. Then she saw the unicorn. She neither moved nor spoke, but her tawny eyes were suddenly big with tears. For a long moment she did not move. Then each fist seized a handful of her hem, and she warped her knees into a kind of trembling crouch. Her ankles were crossed, and her eyes were lowered. But for all that, it took Schmendrick another moment to realize that Molly Grew was curtsying. He burst out laughing, and Molly sprang up, red from hairline to throat, throat hollow. "'Where have you been?' she cried. "'Damn you!' Where have you been? She took a few steps towards Schmendrick, but she was looking beyond him at the unicorn. When she tried to get by, the magician stood in her way. You don't talk like that, he told her, still uncertain that Molly had recognized the unicorn. Don't you know how to behave, woman? You don't curtsy either. But Molly pushed him aside and went up to the unicorn, scolding her as though she were a strayed milk cow. Where have you been? Before the whiteness and the shining horn, Molly shrank to a shrilling beetle. But this time it was the unicorn's old dark eyes that looked down. I am here now, she said at last. Molly laughed with her lips flat. <laughs> and what good is it to me that you're here now? Where were you twenty years ago, ten years ago? How dare you, how dare you come to me now when I am this? With a flap of her hand, she summoned herself up. Barren face, desert eyes, and yellowing heart. I wish you had never come. Why do you come now? The tears began to slide down the sides of her nose. The unicorn made no reply, and Schmendrick said, She is the last. She is the last unicorn in the world. She would be, Molly sniffed. It would be the last unicorn in the world that came to Molly Grew. She reached up then to lay her hand on the unicorn's cheek. But both of them flinched a little, and the touch came to rest on the swift, shivering place under the jaw. Molly said, It's all right. I forgive you. Unicorns are not to be forgiven. The magician felt himself growing giddy with jealousy, not only of the touch, but of something like a secret that was moving between Molly and the unicorn. Unicorns are for beginnings, he said, for innocence and purity, for newness. Unicorns are for young girls. Molly was stroking the unicorn's throat as timidly as though she were blind. She dried her grimy tears on the white mane. You don't know much about unicorns, she said. The sky was a jade grey now, and the trees that had been drawn on the dark a moment ago were real trees again, hissing in the dawn wind. Schmendrig said coldly, looking at the unicorn. We must go. Molly agreed promptly. Aye, before the men stumble on us and slit your throat for cheating them, the poor lads. She looked over her shoulder. I had some things I wanted to take, but they don't matter now. 
I'm ready. Schmendrick barred her way again as he stepped forward. You can't come with us. We are on a quest. His voice and eyes were as stern as he could make them, but he could feel his nose being bewildered. He had never been able to discipline his nose. Molly's own face closed like a castle against him, trundling out the guns and slings and cauldrons of boiling lead. And who are you to say, we? I'm her guide, the magician said importantly. The unicorn made a soft, wandering sound, like a cat calling her kittens. Molly laughed aloud and made it back. You don't know much about unicorns, she repeated. She's letting you travel with her, though I can't think why. But she has no need of you. She doesn't need me either, heaven knows. But she'll take me too. Ask her. The unicorn made the soft sound again, and the castle of Molly's face lowered the drawbridge, and threw wide even its deepest keep. Ask her, she said. Schmendrick knew the unicorn's answer by the sinking in his heart. He meant to be wise, but then his envy and emptiness hurt him, and he heard himself cry out sadly, Never! I forbid it! I, Schmendrick the magician! His voice darkened, and even his nose grew menacing. Be wary of rousing a wizard's wrath! Rousing! If I choose to turn you into a frog, I should laugh myself sick, said Molly Grew pleasantly. You're handy with fairy tales, but you can't turn cream into butter. Her eyes gleamed with a sudden mean understanding. Half sense, man, she said. What were you going to do with the last unicorn in the world? Keep her in a cage? The magician turned away to keep Molly from seeing his face. He did not look directly at the unicorn, but stole small sights of her as stealthily as though he could be made to put them back. White and secret, morning-horned, she regarded him with piercing gentleness, but he could not touch her. He said to the thin woman, you don't even know where we are bound. Do you think it matters to me? Molly asked. She made the cat sound once more. Schmendrick said, We are journeying to King Hagger's country to find the Red Bull. Molly's skin was frightened for a moment, whatever her bones believed or her heart knew. But then the unicorn breathed softly into her cupped hand and Molly smiled as she closed her fingers on the warmth. Well, you're going the wrong way, she said. The sun was rising as she led them back the way they had come, past Collie, still slumped asleep on his stump, across the clearing, and away. The men were returning, dead branches cracked close at hand, and brush broke with a splashing sound, once they had to crouch among thorns while two of Cully's weary rogues limped by, wondering bitterly whether the vision of Robin Hood had been real or not. I smell them, the first man was saying. Eyes are easy to deceive and cheats by nature, but surely no shadow has a smell. The eyes are perjurous right enough, grunted the second man, who seemed to be wearing a swamp. But do you truly trust the testimony of your ears, of your nose, of the root of your tongue? Not I, my friend. The universe lies to our senses, and they lie to us. And how can we ourselves be anything but liars? For myself, I trust neither message nor messenger, neither what I am told nor what I see. There may be truth somewhere, but it never gets down to me. Uh, said the first man with a black grin. But you came running with the rest of us to go with Robin Hood, and you hunted for him all night, crying and calling out the rest of us. Why not save yourself the trouble, if you know better? Well, you never know, the other answered, thickly spitting mud. 
I could be wrong. There were a prince and a princess sitting by a stream in a wooded valley. Their seven servants had set up a scarlet canopy beneath a tree, and the royal young couple ate a box lunch to the accompaniment of lutes and theorbos. They hardly spoke a word to one another until they had finished the meal, and then the princess sighed and said, Well, I suppose I'd best get the silly business over with. The prince began to read a magazine. You might at least, said the princess, but the prince kept on reading. The princess made a sign to two of her servants, who began to play an older music on their lutes. Then she took a few steps on the grass, held up a bridle bright as butter, and called, Here, unicorn, here, here, my pretty, here to me. Come, 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 come. The prince snickered. It's not your chickens you're calling, you know, he remarked without looking up. Why don't you sing something instead of clucking like that? Well, I'm doing the best I can, the princess cried. I've never called one of these things before. But after a little silence, she began to sing. I am a king's daughter, and if I care to keep the moon that has no mistress would flutter in my hair. No one dares to cherish what I choose to crave. Never have I hungered that I did not have. I am a king's daughter, and I grow old with ear. The prison of my person, the shackles of my skin. And I would run away and beg from door to door Just to see a shadow once and never more. So she sang, and sang again, and then she called, Nice unicorn, pretty, 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 for a little longer, and then she said angrily, Well, I've done as much as I'll do. I'm going home. The prince yawned and folded his magazine. You satisfied custom well enough, he told her, and no one expected more than that. It was just a formality. Now we can be married. Yes, the princess said. Now we can be married. The servants began to pack everything away again, while the two with the lutes played joyous wedding music. The princess's voice was a little sad and defiant as she said, If there really were such things as unicorns, one would have come my way. I called as sweetly as anyone could, and I have a golden bridle, and of course I am pure and untouched. For all of me, you are, the prince answered indifferently. As I say, you satisfy custom. You don't satisfy my father, but then neither do I. That would take a unicorn. He was tall, and his face was as soft and pleasant as a marshmallow. When they and the retinue were gone, the unicorn came out of the wood, followed by Molly and the magician, and took up her journey again. A long time later, wandering in another country, where there were no streams and nothing green, Molly asked her why she had not gone to the princess's song. Schmendrick drew near to listen to the answer, though he stayed on his side of the unicorn. He never walked on Molly's side. The unicorn said, That king's daughter would never have run away to see my shadow. If I had shown myself, and she had known me, she would have been more frightened than if she had seen a dragon. For no one makes promises to a dragon. I remember that once it never mattered to me whether or not princesses meant what they sang. I went to them all 
and laid my head in their laps, and a few of them rode on my back, though most were afraid. But I have no time for them now, princesses or kitchen maids. I have no time. Molly said something strange then, for a woman who never slept a night through without waking many times to see if the unicorn was still there, and whose dreams were all of golden bridles and gentle young thieves. As the princesses who have no time, she said, the sky spins and drags everything along with it, princesses and magicians and poor Cully and all, but you stand still. You never see anything just once. I wish you could be a princess for a little while, or a flower, or a duck, something that can't wait. She sang a verse of a doleful limping song, halting after each line, as she tried to recall the next. Who has choices need not choose. We must, who have none. We can love. But what we lose, what is gone, is gone. Schmendrick peered over the unicorn's back into Molly's territory. Where did you hear that song? he demanded. It was the first he had spoken to her since the dawn when she joined the journey. Molly shook her head. I don't remember. I've known it a long time. The land had grown leaner day by day as they travelled on, and the faces of the folk they met had grown bitter with the brown grass. But to the unicorn's eyes, Molly was becoming a softer country, full of pools and caves, where old flowers came burning out of the ground. Under the dirt and indifference, she appeared only thirty-seven or thirty-eight years old, no older than Schmendrick, surely, despite the magician's birthdayless face. Her rough hair bloomed, her skin quickened, and her voice was nearly as gentle to all things as it was when she spoke to the unicorn. The eyes would never be joyous, any more than they could ever turn green or blue, but they too had wakened in the earth. She walked eagerly into King Haggard's realm on bare, blistered feet, and she sang often. And far away, on the other side of the unicorn, Schmendrick the magician stalked in silence. His black cloak was sprouting holes, coming undone, and so was he. The rain that renewed Molly did not fall on him, and he seemed ever more parched and deserted like the land itself. The unicorn could not heal him. A touch of her horn could have brought him back from death, but over despair she had no power, nor over magic that had come and gone. So they journeyed together, following the fleeing darkness into a wind that tasted like nails. The rind of the country cracked, and the flesh of it peeled back into gullies and ravines, or shriveled into scabby hills. The sky was so high and pale that it disappeared during the day, and the unicorn sometimes thought that the three of them must look as blind and helpless as slugs in the sunlight, with their log or their dank rock tumbled away. But she was a unicorn still with a unicorn's way of growing more beautiful in evil times and places. Even the breath of the toads was grumbled in the ditches, and dead trees stopped when they saw her. Toads would have been more hospitable than the sullen folk of Haggard's country. Their villages lay bald as bones between knife-like hills, where nothing grew, and they themselves had hearts unmistakably as sour as boiled beer. Their children stoned strangers into town, and their dogs chased them out again. Several of the dogs never returned, for Schmendrick had developed a quick hand and a taste for mongrel. This infuriated the townsmen as no mere theft would have done. They gave nothing away, 
and they knew that their enemies were those who did. The unicorn was weary of human beings, watching her companions as they slept, seeing the shadows of their dreams scurry over their faces. She would feel herself bending under the heaviness of knowing their names. Then she would run until morning to ease the ache, swifter than rain, swift as loss, racing to catch up with the time when she had known nothing at all but the sweetness of being herself. Often then, between the rush of one breath and the reach of another, it came to her that Schmendrick and Molly were long dead, and King Haggard as well, and the Red Bull met and mastered, so long ago that the grandchildren of the stars that had seen it all happen were withering now, turning to coal, and that she was still the only unicorn left in the world. Then, one owlless autumn evening, they rounded a ridge and saw the castle. It crept into the sky from the far side of a long, deep valley, thin and twisted, bristling with thorny turrets, dark and jagged as a giant's grin. Molly laughed outright, but the unicorn shivered, for to her the crooked towers seemed to be groping toward her through the dusk. Beyond the castle the sea glimmered like iron. Haggard's fortress, Schmendrick murmured, shaking his head in wonderment. Haggard's dire keep. A witch built it for him, they say, but he wouldn't pay her for her work, so she put a curse on the castle. She swore that one day it would sink into the sea with Haggard, when his greed caused the sea to overflow. Then she gave a fearful shriek, the way they do, and vanished into a sulphurous puff. Haggard moved in right away. He said no tyrant's castle was complete without a curse. I don't blame him for not paying her, Molly Grew said scornfully. I could jump on that place myself and scatter it like a pile of leaves. Anyway, I hope the witch has something interesting to do while she waits for the curse to come home. The sea is greater than anyone's greed. Bony birds struggled across the sky, screeling, Help me! Help me! Help me! And small black shapes bobbled at the lightless windows of King Haggard's castle. A wet, slow smell found the unicorn. Where is the bull? she asked. Where does Haggard keep the bull? No one keeps the red bull, the magician replied quietly. I have heard that he roams at night and lies up by day in a great cavern beneath the castle. We'll know soon enough, but that's not our problem now. The nearer danger lies there. He pointed down into the valley, where a few lights had begun to shiver. That is Hag's Gate, he said. Molly made no answer, but she touched the unicorn with a hand as cold as a cloud. She often put her hands on the unicorn when she was sad, or tired, or afraid. This is King Haggard's town, Schmendrick said, the first one he took when he came over the sea, the one that has lain longest under his hand. It has a wicked name, though none I ever met could say exactly why. No one goes into Hag's Gate, and nothing comes out of it but tales to make children behave. Monsters, werebeasts, witch coven's demons in broad daylight, and the like. But there is something evil in Hag's Gate, I think. Mummy Fortuna would never go there, and once she said that even Haggard was not safe while Hag's Gate stood. There is something there. He peered closely at Molly as he spoke, for it was his one bitter pleasure these days to see her frightened, in spite of the white presence of the unicorn. But she answered him quite calmly, with her hands at her sides. I have heard Hagsgate called the town that no man knows. Maybe its secret was waiting for a woman to find it out. A woman and a unicorn. But what's to be done with you? 
Schmendrick smiled in. I'm no man, he said. I'm a magician with no magic. And that's no one at all. The foxfire lights of Hagsgate grew brighter as the unicorn watched them, but not even a flint flared in King Haggard's castle. It was too dark to see men moving on the walls, but across the valleys she could hear the soft boom of armor and the clatter of pikes on stone. Sentinels had met and marched away again. The smell of the red bull sported all around the unicorn as she started down the thin brambly path that led to Hag's Gate.